All right, welcome back everyone to another GoLab talk. Um, again, I'm Latara. I'll be managing the talk and Q&A sessions. Uh, today, we're about to watch a recorded video by Daniel Marti called Diving into the Goal Tool Chain to Obfuscate Builds. Uh, I'll bring Daniel live just a moment so I can read his intro for you. Let's go live with Daniel. Hello, <laughs> welcome Hi. to GoLab. We're so happy to have you here. Happy to be here. Yeah, awesome. So I'll read your bio in the abstract and then we'll get to the video. So Daniel was bar born in Barcelona. He's now living in England for its food and weather. <laughs> he has been involved with Go since 2014, including writing tools, libraries, and contributing to Go itself. And so about today's talk, uh, here's the abstract. Go has a great ecosystem for tooling. Not only is the language fairly simple, but there are also excellent libraries to parse, type check, and manipulate code. Thanks to the above, many tools exist out there from linters to dependency analyzers and editor into integrations. However, there's a space that hasn't been explored much so far, which is modifying Go builds, in particular by hooking straight into the Go build command and its components such as the compiler and linker. Uh, in this session, we'll dive deep into how the Go tool chain works, what pieces are the most interesting, and what kind of tools could be built with them. Uh, finally, we will walk through a real, case, a real use case, obfuscating Go code. Thanks to the legwork in the previous session, we'll quickly show how to obfuscate Go code straight from uh, Go build without a custom pre-process setup. So we're just about to go to the video now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. All right, so everyone, enjoy the talk and stay tuned at the end. We'll do the live Q&A as always. Uh, and of course, another gentle reminder, please, 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 if you have questions to ask, please ask them in the Q&A chat. You have the room chat button and then you have the one with the question mark. It's not the help button, it's the Q&A chat. So uh, please ask your questions there and we'll answer them at the end live with Daniel. So uh, enjoy the show. Enjoy the talk and uh, stay tuned. Thanks. Hi, my name is Daniel, and I'm going to be talking about diving into the Go toolchain to obfuscate builds. So let me introduce a term. The term is nerd sniping. And this actually comes from an XKCD comic, and it begins with somebody seeing a scientist and presenting them with a difficult problem. Now, the scientist gets stuck thinking about their problem until they find a solution, even if there isn't a good solution. So let's come to the nerd snipe that got me here and it's how to obfuscate Go builds. So this began with a friend bringing a bug in Go to me. And when I looked at the code, it looked something like this. And this is not code that you would normally write. It actually looks kind of weird. And the reason it was written this way is so that somebody trying to reverse engineer the binary would have a harder time figuring out what, what was happening. So for example, the user agent string is actually encoded in base64, and then it's decoded at init time. And similarly, a bunch of function names are shorter than usual because you want to sort of conceal what they actually do and then in the comments you say what they actually do. So the idea here is pretty simple. You want to conceal the program's purpose, you want to make tampering or reverse engineering more difficult, and you want to make your code harder for humans to understand. Now, maintaining obfuscated code, especially manually obfuscated code, is horrible. It's pretty difficult. And it actually makes human mistakes more likely because uh, you yourself also have to read and maintain that code. Overall, this just needs automation, some sort of tool. Now, a quick PSA before we continue. I certainly do not encourage the use of code obfuscation. It is just security through obscurity. Um, it can only buy you a bit of time against somebody trying to figure out what your program does. But if they have enough resources and time and patience, they can do it anyway, because the program is there and it behaves the same way. So let's talk about automation. 
plenty of tools like this exist for other languages. Um, the most common um, area of this would be code minification, which is pretty common in JavaScript, uh, because in JavaScript, you download the source code, you don't download a binary. So what kind of software do we have in Go for this? So let's use a sample program to, to move forward. Uh, I've, got a, I've got a main function that calls another function with the input arguments. And this function, if it's given a specific number of arguments, in this case, itself plus two more, it will print a very secret endpoint, for example, for an API that we deployed as a Tor service, and then it's going to panic. And otherwise, it will just print the number of arguments it was given. So if we wanted to obfuscate this, we would want to make it so that calling, so that finding this string or figure out, figuring out how it's used is harder unless you have the original source code. So our first try would be to just compile it. And you might think that compiling is enough. And it does strip some information like comments and inline constants. But it's, it doesn't do much else. Uh, it pretty much ends there. A lot of other useful information is still there. So for example, if I build this main.go and I run it with two arguments, triggering the printing of the URL and the panic, you can see that the panic still contains the name of the function, where I was when I built this, this program, as well as the file name and line number for that function. So this is actually quite a lot of information. Some function here doesn't tell you anything because it's just an example. But if this function was called something like send a request to the API, then it would be pretty obvious what it's doing. We can also find the variable name in the, in the binary, even though it's not used in the panic. And we can also figure out the Go version that built this binary, in this case, a version from master a few days ago as well as what module and what version of that module we're on. So there's actually a lot of information that we're leaking through for no good reason, unless we actually want it to. And finally, fi finding the strings, such as this, this HTTPS URL, is pretty simple. There is a tool called strings, and it's meant for C programs, so it's a little bit funky for Go programs. But we can sort of use, we can use a, a, a TR to replace spaces with new lines to make it a little bit easier so, so that it doesn't give us a huge line. And if we grab for HTTPS, you can see that it's pretty easy to find the string in the raw binary, even though I have pretty much no experience with reverse engineering binaries. So another thing we could do is we could run this program in a, in a debugger, because the debugging information is still there. So this is clearly not enough for the multiple examples I've shown so far. Now, uh, there's a build flag called trim path, and that is going to remove the absolute paths from the build, from the line, from the position information. So that's good. And we can also use the linker flags dash w and dash s to remove debugging information in the symbol table. So that's also good. If we do those things, you should notice that panic still does the same. So it still shows the, the function name. It still shows the, the file name and line number but it no longer shows where I was when I built, thanks to trim path, trim path. And similarly, because debugging information is now missing, some information like variable names is now missing, which is also good. So another thing that, there may, that remains here is the Go version information. And pretty much everything else that we mentioned before is still there. So this is clearly still not enough, even though we added a bunch, bunch of flags. So our third try is what existing obfuscators exist in Go, not just build flags. So there is one called Gobfuscate, which I think was created a couple of years ago. And what it does is pretty simple. It copies an entire Go path, including your dependencies. It obfuscates all of that code and then builds it. And this is actually pretty adva advanced because it can do a lot of things. It can inspect your entire program all at once in source code. It can make arbitrary changes it could even, for example, merge all of the packages into a single package. But this is pretty slow, and it doesn't support modules, uh, because this was designed for the GoPath world. But for the past few years, we've been moving from GoPath to modules, so this tool is a little bit outdated at this point. So the try number four is let's build something. Now, I want to have a few design decisions um, about this tool before we actually write any code.
the first design decision is this must integrate with Go Build. I don't want it to be a tool that takes all of your source code, modifies it, and then you run Go Build later, because this is going to be really slow, and it's also going to be hard to support, for example, modules, because sometimes your dependencies are not even on your system. You might have to download them, for example. The design decision number two is that the tool must be deterministic and reproducible, just like Go Build. So in Go Build, if you build a binary and then build it again, the result is going to be the same, unless you changed something in the input, like the, like the source code or one of the dependencies. And reproducible builds are generally good for open source software so that your users can build the same binaries that you built and published. And that doesn't really apply here, because if you obfuscate a binary, supposedly you're not publishing the source code. But still, I think it's a good thing for the tool to be deterministic, because this just makes it easier to reason about and essentially easier to develop and uh, test. And the last design decision is that some of the changes that it applies to obfuscate the source code should be reversible by the author. That is, if you have the original source code. And this can be useful to, for example, if you obfuscate a binary and publish it, and somebody sends you a panic stack trace, obviously all the names and all the information is going to be missing or is going to be shuffled. But if you have the original source code, you should be able to unshuffle, de-obfuscate that information to obtain the original one, to, for example, debug what happened without having to manually guess like anybody else would. So let's look at the guts of Go's build system, and let's look at how that would look like. Now, here we have our main.go file, like we saw before. It's in a sample module. It doesn't really matter. We can build it, and we can run it. And we can also use the v flag to see what happens when we build it. And the v flag tells us what packages are being compiled. And if we run it a bunch of times, we can see that nothing is being compiled. And this is because the binary already exists. So if we remove it, we can see that we can see that uh, go build takes a little bit longer now because it needs to relink that binary. But all the packages that it needs to compile are already compiled in the build cache. So it's still not doing very much work. Now we can use a flag called a, which essentially asks, please rebuild all the packages, even if they're already in the build cache. And you can see that it rebuilt a bunch of standard library packages, as well as our main package. And this took a little bit longer, as expected. We can also use another flag called x. And this is going to be quite verbose, but it's going to be very useful because it's going to show us exactly what happens under the hood, what commands go build runs. So we can see, for example, that it runs the compiler on, on our main.go file with a bunch of flags that we don't really care about right now. It outputs that the result of that compilation into a .a file, also called an object file or an archive file. And that .a file then gets linked with the linker. So you can see the argument here. And the output is a binary, an executable file, which then gets copied into the current directory. And then we can finally just run it. So that's all good so far. But what's interesting here is that if we look at Go Build, Go Build is not really doing anything itself, or rather not all that much. Its main job is to act as a build tool, kind of like how Make or CMake uh, behave. And the actual compilation of packages or linking of binaries happens with other tools, such as compile and link, that get executed as subprocesses. And you should notice that compilation of packages can be parallelized, because you only need to have compiled a package's dependencies before you compile that package. So if a package depends on four dependencies, you can probably compile those four in parallel to speed up the build. So now that we're looking at this output, what we really want to do is to somehow alter what the compiler does. Because Go build runs, it figures out all the packages need to download and so on. Uh, sorry, all the modules that it needs to download, if that's the case. Uh, 
And then later, it runs a compiler on our source code. But our source code is not obfuscated. So we want to somehow alter the input to the compiler at this level, at this stage. So there is actually a flag we can use for this. And it's called toolexec. And what toolexec does is it uses a program to invoke those two the toolchain programs like the compiler and the linker. So it's essentially a way to control how they get run. And we could, for example, alter the arguments, or we could remove some arguments, or we could choose to not run the tool at all if we want to. So let's play with this for a little bit. Let's create, let's create a simple script. And we want the script to just report what it should be running and then just run it. And we also want it to time um, how long that process takes. So we have to make that executable. And then we do go build a tool exec. It has to be an absolute path uh, because otherwise it wouldn't find it. So if we run this, this is going to fail. And the reason for that is because uh, the go build tool asks the compiler what version it is. And we're adding the timing information there, and then it gets confused. So we can work around that. If the second argument is v full, let's just run that and do nothing else. Cool, so that works now. So for every package that we're building, the go build tool tells us, hey, while I was compiling this package, something was printed that I wasn't expecting, because by default, the compiler and linker don't print anything. And you can see our code in action. So we print the full command that should be run, kind of like the x flag, and then we time it. So this is a pretty simple but effective way to see where the time is going when you build something. So you can see, for example, compiling our, our main package was actually really fast because it's only a few lines of Go. Linking it took about 100 milliseconds, not too bad. Some other packages took longer. Um, this one, I believe, is the OS package because it has a lot of Go files. Cool. So toolexec looks exactly like what we need. It allows us to man in the middle of the compiler. So Using that, we can alter the parameters to the compiler to, for example, take the input Go files, cha change them in some way uh, after parsing them, and then write copies that are modified somewhere else and compile those instead. So we begin our project here, and we call it Garble. And something else we could do here as an incremental step is remove module information. Um, now, the way the way Go injects the module information into a module build is by adding a Go mod file at the end of the compilation as the last Go file in the compilation of the main package. So we can simply remove that argument, and then the module information is missing. We could also re replace file names. So when we write copies of the input source files, um, we can use a temporary directory and we can name them something like f1, f2, f3, and so on. So then you cannot infer any context or meaning from the original file names, such as, for example, client.go or server.go. We could also make line numbers less useful, and this is using a special comment that the compiler understands, and it's called slash slash line. And what that does is it essentially says forget the line number that I'm currently in and the file name, and just replace them with what I'm telling you now. So if we add those comments right before each function declaration, we can then change the line number for any function declaration without having to physically move the function declarations in the file. So we could use this to, for example, replace all line numbers with the number one, or we could use it to shuffle all the line numbers so that there's there's still something that looks 
reasonable, but they're all shuffled around. So you cannot, for example, tell which which function was at the top or which function was before with another function and so on. Now, let's talk about the first hard problem that we need to tackle here, and that is literals. And we can talk about strings because that is the easiest use case and also the one that we have in our example. So like we showed before, our main binary contains the HTTPS string for the URL that we're using in this program. And if an attacker or somebody else knows that this program is using an HTTPS URL, they can just search for it and find it pretty easily because it's in plain text. And up to this point, we've been simply removing data, such as debug info, file names, line numbers, and so on. But we cannot simply remove strings or other literals because we would break the program without those. But we still don't want them to be so easy to find. The first idea we could have here is to base64 encode all the strings and generate a bit of code to decode that base64 when the strings are used. Uh, this way, the strings cannot are not in plain text, so they cannot be found as easily. But base64 is still a pretty simple pattern uh, that you can pretty easily find and undo. So this is how the transformation could look like. Uh, so we replace, for example, a global variable with another one that contains base64 data, and then a function that just undoes that process. Another idea we could have here is to use encryption. So this, will be, this would be harder to find because encrypted data just looks like random bytes. But bear in mind that we still have to include the encryption key in the binary. So the encryption doesn't actually gain us all that much. And the decryption calls are still going to be pretty easy to spot. Uh, and finally, any encryption is going to be an added dependency, especially if it's um, a heavy cryptographic library. So this is still not a good idea. A third idea could be to alter the strings in a way that's reversible, but the alteration is arbitrary, seemingly random to the user. And then we generate code in place to undo those operations. So for example, we could XOR a bunch of random bytes from the string and then generate the code to XOR them back to the original value. And this way, each string could be obfuscated differently uh, so it would be significantly harder to spot a pattern or undo all of those at once. An improvement on that idea is to have multiple me mechanisms to alter these strings and then pick one at random or even use multiple at once. So you could have a mechanism that shifts the data, another mechanism that swaps a bunch of bytes, another mechanism that splits up the bytes and joins them back in a different order. Um, so these are all pretty simple, but the idea is that the less simple and predictable that the system is, the harder it is to reverse engineer if you don't know what's going on. Now, there are a bunch of caveats here. Obfuscating literals can really slow down your program, especially if they're in a sensitive part uh, performance-wise. It could also make your binaries larger, because after all, you're just generating more code. Uh, so in the end, I don't believe this should be a, a default behavior. Uh, at least in my tool, it's a built is a, it's an opt-in flag, because it's really something that you should choose on a case by case basis. And here's another open question: What should you do with short or simple literals? What about the string foo, or the single character string colon, or what about numbers like eighty eighty or five four three? So, probably in general, any literal which takes less than a handful of bytes is likely not worth obfuscating because it's likely so simple um, that it's probably easier to guess uh, and it's not you know storing as much useful information as larger literals like a whole URL for example. So here's a second hard problem that we tackle and that is import paths. So even if we obfuscate names to for example re replace them with hashes Import paths can still guide us and tell us what's going on. So this um, declaration here, it says strings dot something on some variable and then the string colon. This could be quite a few things, but if you if you have read a lot of Go code, you can probably guess that this is either strings dot join or strings dot split, just because how often 
colon is used as a separator for those things. So the problem here is that import paths are pretty core to how Go packages get built, because they tell you what other packages you depend on, and the Go tool uses that information to resolve and find and possibly download those packages. So we cannot simply refactor how this works at a low level, because we're not in control of that. The first idea that we could have here is to modify the source code to replace or rewrite those import paths. If we had the entire Go path at once, like Gopfiscate, we could do that. But we have decided not to do that for multiple reasons, such as how slow that would be and what a bottleneck it would be. So we, we have to skip this option. The second idea could be to rename those import paths when they're imported. So for example, um, instead of using strings by its package name strings, name it something else, like a short hash, and then use that hash. And this does work in the input source code. Um, this does not say strings. But the result is essentially no change whatsoever, because this name is only for humans. The compiler just inlines the actual package name in the call. So this is just not useful. The third idea we could have is to edit the output binary directly, uh, because the output binary does, con does still contain those input paths. So theoretically, we could edit the, the compiled executable, the build executable, to replace those with whatever we want. But in practice, this is very difficult and a lot of work. And the reason is because different operating systems have different executable file formats. So we would have to not only support all of them, but test and you know investigate all of them, which would probably be multiple worth, multiple months worth of work. Uh, the fourth idea we could have here is to do something in between, neither uh, neither modify the input source code because we've seen that doesn't work, nor modify the output binary, because in between we've got something else. We've got the archive files that the compiler produces. And those archive or object files then get linked into, the, into a, an executable binary. Now, these archive files, they're not a standard format. They're a Go-specific format. But that format is still pretty well defined and supported within Go itself. So can we just use that to edit those files? So the answer is yes. Uh, somebody did this as a contribution, which was pretty impressive. What they did was essentially copy uh, a Go internal package called GoOpt, uh, which is to support Go object files. And that gives you the ability to read, as in parse, and write um, those archive files. And obviously, you also need to do quite a lot of research to understand how those archive files work. But we're not going to get into that here. And then you carefully, very carefully edit the contents of that archive file to modify the input paths. For example, to replace them with short, unique hashes, and you just store that somewhere and link that against the with the final binary. Now, obviously, you would need a lot of tests, and you would probably introduce quite a few bugs with which we did. So this is a process that is quite a bit difficult and requires a lot of patience. As a third hard problem, I want to talk about deterministic builds, which is something that I mentioned initially, but I haven't mentioned since. And let's take a simple example. How would you, what would you do with names such as function and variable names? We can't just delete them because those names still have to be in the source code. And you cannot name them all foo because names have to mean different things if they're different. So we could replace them with random data encoded in May64, for example. But random data is not deterministic, so we cannot do that. We could hash the names and then use a short a short um, substring of that hash. And that would work. But the problem there is that if you have a name like foo, it's always going to, to be hashed the same way. And you could have, for example, a table of common names like client or server. And you could very quickly realize what the original name was. So we need some sort of uh, salt or seed to add to that hashing so that it's not so easy to undo. And we still want that hash, that Salter seed to be deterministic. But that Salter seed needs to be unpredictable to the end user. And that seed 
or salt has to change between packages, or if the source code changes. If the salt was always, always the same, if you cracked, if you reverse engineered one binary, you could pretty much reverse engineer any binary because you would have the salt for all the packages and all the names. So here's where we look at the output of the X flag again, go build dash X. And we notice that the compiler gets a flag passed called build ID. And this build ID looks like it's a bunch of hashes. Now, there is a pretty formal definition of what build IDs are, but the only thing we really care about is that the first part until this slash here is a hash of the inputs to whatever we're doing here. So for example, if we're compiling a package, the hash of the inputs is going to be the hash of all the Go files of that package and the hashes of the dependencies, as in the hashes of the object files for the imported packages by this package. And because this hash is of all the inputs, if you don't have the source code for this program, for this package, it's practically impossible to guess what the hash was, because this is a pretty long hash. You could potentially do it, but it's incredibly difficult. So then to hash a name, for example, foo, what we do first is the names have to begin with a letter. They can't begin with a number. So we can't just use arbitrary base64. And we want this to be unexported. So we use a lowercase z to begin. And then we hash with, for example, SHA-256, the name, and also the build ID that we just showed, the hash of the inputs to the build. And then the resulting SHA uh, hash, we just take, uh, we, we do a base64 because this has to be a valid identifier. And then we just take a short substring, for example, four by four letters. And then we just use that in the build. And the interesting part here is that if the build changes in any way, so for example, you change a bunch of lines or you update a dependency, then this build ID will change. And then this name will also change. So essentially, two different builds will be obfuscated differently, which is very interesting. And build IDs, we can also use them as seeds for pretty much anything else we want. They're, a hash is essentially a pretty long number. So we can use it as a, as a seed to shuffle position information. Uh, we can use it as a seed to choose random bytes to alter in a string uh, with, for example, XOR. Uh, we could use it as a seed to shuffle the order of, of file names so that you know, the file name that comes first alphabetically might not be the first one in the end. Uh, and at the end, it, as long as you use this build ID as a seed, whatever you do is going to be deterministic, which is what we want. Lastly, I want to talk about build caching. Our tool works, but it's really slow. We need to use the A flag to force rebuilding all the packages every single time. If we didn't do that, we would most likely reuse previously cached builds, which might not be obfuscated. For example, if you do go build followed by our build. Now let's look at build IDs once again. I did say that the first component is the hash of the inputs for a compilation, for example, and that is true, but I didn't include one important component there, which is that which is the version of the tool. In this case, if you're compiling a package and the version of the compiler changes, for example, because you change the line in the compiler and then rebuild the compiler, then this would change and this hash would change, and then you would have to rebuild recompile that package, which makes sense, right? Otherwise, if you mo if you upgraded your Go version or changed your compiler, none of the packages that you previously built would need to be rebuilt. So let's look at how that works in action. So let's run our sample script again. And we can see we can see, like we said, that it's pretty slow. Every time we rerun it, it needs to recompile all the packages. And how does it ask the compiler what version it is? It essentially runs the equivalent of this, which is what we had to work around earlier by not doing anything when the compiler is providing its own version information. And you should note that if you're running master, a master build of Go, uh, 
you will get versions like this, which are essentially hashes, like the other hashes we've seen so far. But if you use if you use a full release of Go, it will simply report the human readable version that it's currently on, because it's assumed that those released versions never change. All good so far? So what can we do here? So what's interesting here is that the last component of this build ID, like we said before, build IDs have slashes that separate them into multiple things. And we already explained that the first component is the hash of the inputs. So in this case, it would be the inputs that the compiler was built with. So the compiler's own source code, as well as the compiler's dependencies and so on. But the last component is the hash of the result. And here, the hash of the result is the hash of the compiler binary itself. So if the compiler changes in any way, this hash changes. And then when we compile something, the version that gets included in the hash of the inputs is this. So that was quite a lot of information. But essentially, what's interesting here is that we can do our tool is garble. And when it wraps calls to the compiler, this includes the v equals full uh, calls. So what we can do is we print the compiler's own version unchanged. But at the end, we say, oh, wait, actually, I am something that changes what the compiler does because I'm changing the inputs, I'm changing the result. And I'm actually replacing the original build ID. I don't care about these three, so I'm going to just leave them empty. And this works for now, uh, and that's good enough for me. But the last component of the build ID, which is the hash of the compiler, I'm going to use a different hash. And this hash is going to be the hash of the compiler itself and the hash of the garble tool itself. So if either of those two changes, this, this hash will change. And the cool thing here is that this works, because now if I do garble build, and this is, I forgot that this does not work with work with Go Master right now. But if I do, if I use a stable version of Go, this should work now. Cool, so that works. And if I rerun it, it's really fast. Even if I remove the binary, it's still really fast because it doesn't have to rebuild all the dependency packages because of this trick to essentially trick the build cache into thinking that it can ca cache and using a different uh, hash so that the, the the build cache files don't conflict with non-obfuscated um, compilation results. And finally, as, as the end of my demo, I'm just going to show what happens when you run an obfuscated package, uh, an obfuscated binary. You can see that the string looks the same. That's fine. But as, as explained earlier, the names of package names and function names and file names and line numbers are all shuffled around. So that's everything I've got. Thank you for listening. I hope that was useful. And I'm leaving a link to the tool if you want to play around with it. Thank you. All right, everyone, we are ready to go live with Daniel to answer any and all questions you have. So let's bring him on. Hello there. Hi. <laughs> nice to have you here, Daniel. Thanks so much for being here this year, even if it is uh, virtually. We're happy to have you. Happy to be here. For sure, for sure. Um, let's see. OK, we have a couple questions coming in. Before we go to those questions, um, did you have anything you wanted to add or say about your participation in GoLab? Um, I guess the only thing is that I actually came to GoLab a couple of years ago, and I really enjoyed the food. So I actually do miss that part of GoLab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. I've heard a couple of people say that. Yeah, hopefully next year it'll be live, but uh, eh, crossing our fingers. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
All right, so let's go ahead and look at some of the questions. The first one is from Andre Simon, who says, uh, did you face a situation when you needed to obfuscate the generated binary file? Mm, not really. Like if I'm obfuscating code, most likely I'm the author as well. So um, if I have the source code, I might as well just obfuscate the source code because it's much easier. Um, I think I mentioned this in the slide somewhere. You could potentially alter the binary directly, but I think that's far, far more complex. Like right now, if I want to change the name of a, of a function, I just edit the Go code. It's really simple. If I wanted to do that in a compiled binary, I would have to essentially alter um, the, the compiled bytecode, which is, I mean, I guess it would be possible, but it would be a lot of work. And you would have to support x86, 64-bit. You would have to support ARM, MIPS, and so on. Uh, it would be kind of complex, I bet. Sure, that makes sense. Um, all right, a more, ooh, uh, maybe a more in-depth question would be uh, from Manuel here, who says, uh, sorry if I misunderstood you, but at the start, you basically said, I don't think you should obfuscate, but then why did you spend this much energy on it? <laughs> well, that's why I called it a nerd snipe, because it's it's not even something that I wanted initially. It's some like somebody brings a problem, and then you go like, actually, that is an interesting problem. And then you just end up building something just for the sake of it. Um, I do think that in general, you shouldn't obfuscate, because I think in general, it doesn't make sense. But in, in a few use cases, as long as you understand that it doesn't add any security, it only sort of makes it harder to reverse engineer. I think, I think if you understand that trade-off, and you're happy to, for example, you know, use the extra tool, add the extra dependency, make your binaries a little bit more complex. I think in that edge case, it can make sense. Sure, sure. And Manuel says, OK, I get that. So awesome. All right, um, let's see. We have another question coming in just now, which is from VA Amaranth, who says, uh, once the binary is obfuscated and the binary is out in the wild, how do we map the stack trace back to the code that we compiled with? Uh, so this is not implemented right now, but it would actually be pretty simple. So most obfuscators, what they would do is they would generate a map file or something like that. And what that would do is, for example, imagine a table in a TXT file or a JSON file. And then it, it just shows you original name, garbled, or obfuscated name. And then if you have a, a stack trace or something like that, um, where you, you have a new name, you have a, an obfuscated name, and you want to go back to the original one, you just look up the table, right? Um, we could do that, but the problem is if you lose the map file, it's game over. Um, and, and I think that's kind of pretty terrible UX. And that's part of the reason why I made the tool deterministic, because if you have the source code, you can just generate the table again, right? Doesn't matter if it doesn't matter if you lost the map file. So at that point, why even have a map file at all? So the idea would be uh, imagine a command like garble on garble or garble undo or something like that. And then you just give it like a stack trace, or you give it a name or something like that. And then it does the entire build again. And then once it finds the names that it needs, it just stops. And then it just tells you, hey, this is what the original name was. All right, thank you for that. Uh, let's see, we've got another question in main chat by Marco, who says, uh, do you need to keep all the versions of Garble to uh, unobfuscate? I mean, if a new gar version of Garble changes the format, I think you need to use the same garble version to unobfuscate, um, referring to the stack trace, for example, he says. That is a very good point. I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> um, I, I guess, so I guess if you're shipping, for example, a binary to people or to machines, and then you have to undo this process, I guess in that case, you would stick to a stable version of garble and then not change that version of garble very often, because every time you change it, you have to also uh, remember which one you used for that build. Um, but I think at the same time, you don't want to tell people what version of Garble you used, or even that you used Garble at all, because if they know that, they could sort of understand what happened and how things were done. And if, for example, an older version of Garble had a bug uh, that could be you know, um, uh, attacked, then you don't want them to know that very easily. Sure. But, but yes, you would, have, you, you would need the same version of Garble that was used for obfuscation. OK. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, OK, a two-part question by Elon, who says, uh, does it reduce binary size like it would in JavaScript? And if so, by how much? If not, uh, what percentage does it increase size? 
Um, so the most basic things it does, like removing debug information, they do remove, they do reduce binary size quite a lot. That's to be expected. Uh, you can get that very easily by just using the flags yourself. You don't have to use Garble. Uh, beyond that, it's more or less a wash because all the names, for example, become, I think it was four characters, um, four or five. Yeah, five characters. So in the end, you know, some variables originally or some function names might have been shorter. Some other names might have been longer. Uh, so in the end, I think it was something like binaries might get like 1% smaller, but it's nothing that actually matters all that much. Yeah, not um, too significant. Removing, removing the file names does help quite a lot, but trim path also gets you most of that. Uh, we do have a, a flag called tiny, and tiny is sort of that trade-off. It says, I want to make the binaries even smaller, even if that makes the obfuscation a little bit less powerful. Uh, so for example, instead of using hashes for the names, it just names the variables A to Z uh, and so on. So it just gives them the shortest name possible. Um, so if you do that, it has some advantages such as smaller binaries, um, but you might not be able to undo the process um, as easily. OK. All right, thank you for that. Um, another question in chat by Andre Simo. What do you think about the new proposal of supporting embedded binary files directly in the Go core code base? I think that proposal is awesome. Um, I've been waiting for it for years. Um, I, I think it was a very difficult proposal to put forth because it needed a lot of uh, base work, one of them being the file system proposal, the file system interface proposal, which has been a little bit controversial, but I think they've all been accepted now. So they're going to be in Go 116, I think. Fantastic. All right. Um, well, I think that was the last question for today, unless anyone else has any others. Um, I'm just checking the chat really quickly to see if I uh, went over anything. I think no. Wait, we've got another one. All right. Another question here by Aurelien. Uh, who says, are there other use cases for plunging, uh, sorry, plugging into the Go build process apart from obfuscating the code? Um, if you mean tool exec, uh, assuming you do, I think there are quite a few. Um, for example, Go fuzz, I'm, I'm sure some of you are familiar with that. It's a tool that lets you fuzz your code, such as give it random inputs and see what happens, see if it crashes, see if it hangs and, and stuff like that. And the way Go fuzzed works is pretty basic. Uh, because it's pretty, the design is pretty old, probably older than ToolExec, I think. Um, so what it would do is it would copy all of your code and then modify it and then build it and then run it, kind of like Copfuscate. Uh, but you could do something like ToolExec, because at the end of the day, I don't know if you could do exactly what I do, but at the end of the day, you want to do a build with different source code. Uh, and that is not obfuscation. It's just inserting code to, for example, figure out what the program is doing, uh, or just enter the GoFuzz entry point and things like that. Um, I think. Some compiler developers also use tool exec to time parts of the compiler or to like build trace graphs and stuff like that. Um, you can imagine pretty much any use case that just lets you run arbitrary code inside a Go build. OK, thank you for that. Um, let's see. No, we got that one. So I think that was the last question for today. So um, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. So then I want to say special thanks for Danielle for coming here, GoLab virtually this year. Uh, hopefully, we'll have you in the next edition too. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming. Was there anything else you wanted to add? Um, I guess I just wanted to apologize for the horrible audio quality in my video. It's actually what made me realize I, should, I probably should buy a mic. So next time it's going to be better. Uh, it's all good. You know, uh, everyone has some technical difficulties, especially when we have to do these kinds of things live. So don't worry. And people say the audio was fine. And I would agree with that, too. So. Great. Sounds good. All right. Well, uh, we'll see you around. Hope you enjoy the rest of GoLab. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day. Bye. Bye. Fantastic. All right, you guys. Yeah, everyone is saying thanks for the talk and the audio was fine. Absolutely. Um, so you can rate this talk at the GoLab page on the agenda if you'd like. And uh, we'll be waiting for you for the last talk of the day, which is happening in about 20 minutes or so. And that is Advanced Dependency Management in Go Using FX. And that's by Kreslav Mikhailov. And so we'll see you there. All right. Take care, everyone.